Hello and welcome to another session of the Avalog Lecture Forum, where we look at international dates, anniversaries, personalities, key figures in the world of international relations, and the impact it is having on all of us. On this particular session of the Avalog Lecture Forum, we're going to mark a key anniversary. It is the 99th anniversary of the Republic of Turkey. The country is on the eve of its centenary, and we're focusing today on multilateralism and Turkey's multilateral foreign policy with special emphasis on NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. To discuss this aspect that much further, we've invited the founding director of the Turkish Center for Asia Pacific Studies in Ankara, Turkey. He's also a faculty member and associate professor in globalization and development programs of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Beijing Normal University, the Hong Kong Baptist University, United International College, which is based in Guangdong province in China. He was formerly an advisor at the Center for Strategic Research of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Turkey. And his research interests include political and security issues in international relations, particularly looking at East Asia, Central Eurasia, and of course, Turkish foreign policy. We're indeed honored and privileged to have with us Professor Dr. Salchuk Cholak Olu. Professor, thank you very much for taking time to join us and be a part of this session of the Aval of Lecture Forum, where we focus on the 99th anniversary of Turkey's independence as a republic. Professor, if I were to invite you to tell us about Turkey's multilateral foreign policy with special focus on NATO and ESCO, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cook. So also thank you for uh, having me for this very uh, unique program. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy is multidimensional. Uh, and uh, this is ba basically because of Turkey's geopolitical location. Turkey is, uh, is in a transitional country. Uh, maybe it is in the uh, meeting of three continents. Europe, Asia, and Africa. And because of the historical past uh, during the Ottoman Empire for six centuries, so Turkey, uh, basically today's Turkey, Turkey's border has become uh, an intersection of uh, different uh, geographies, cultures, political movements, and others. Uh, so since the foundation of the Republic of Turkey in 1923, uh, there was a more radical decision uh, by the uh, founders of the uh, Turkish Republic, uh, led by the Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, to more uh, pro-European or pro-West uh, direction of the country. Of course, uh, when we look at the Turkish modernization, basically, it has uh, it had been started uh, in the uh, early 19th century during the Ottoman time. And the founder of the uh, Republic of Turkey uh, also uh, graduated from uh, Western schools uh, uh, founded during the Ottoman period. Uh, in that sense, there are uh, traditional institutions, uh, schools and courts, and uh, modernist uh, European institutions together. So after the foundation of the uh, Republic of Turkey, Turkey has transformed itself from a a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious empire to, to a nation state. So there is a rebuilding of nation and the rebuilding of uh, state identity and the rebuilding of the foreign policy for that. Of course, there are some similarities uh, for Turkey's foreign policy uh, with the Ottoman Empire. And also there are some inherited uh, institutions from the Ottoman time. But within the new borders of the Republic of Turkey, so then uh, the, uh, the founding fathers of the Republic uh, have some uh, have fixed some po certain policies. These policies also still influential uh, to, to the present time. Uh, some of them, at least. Uh, and so this is one dimension. And also uh, after that third period and after the uh, end of the Second World War, Turkey uh, made another choice to uh, push uh, its drift to uh, further west. So to integrate with the West uh, more and uh, with the outbreak of the Cold War and uh, the Soviet expansion in Eastern Europe and uh, bordering with the Soviet Union. So this was a big challenge. And also uh, just after the Second World War, 
uh, Soviet leader uh, Joseph Stalin also demanded a uh, military base, uh, bases in Istanbul, and also demanded some uh, Turkey's territory from Northeast uh, provinces, today's bordering Georgia. Uh, so this, this was very alarming uh, for, for the Turkish leaders. Uh, so then they decided to join the Western camp and uh, European countries at the time, basically Western Europe uh, was weak. Uh, half of uh, Europe was under occupation, including Eastern Germany. Uh, so France and Britain, uh, Turkey's uh, uh, allies before the Second World War uh, were not strong enough. So the only uh, security guarantee, uh, guarantee for Turkey would be uh, United States. So for this uh, aim, the Turkish uh, leaders, uh, both uh, Prime Minister, uh, President, uh, and Travis, the Prime Minister Ismet Minoni, and then uh, Democratic elected uh, government, uh, Democrat Party government's uh, Prime Minister Adnan Menderes and President Celal Bayer decided uh, to join uh, to NATO after its foundation. So Turkey, within this aim, to send uh, troops to, to the Korean War uh, in the, uh, with, the, uh, with the solidarity of the Western countries under the uh, UN mission. But uh, at the time of the Korean War, Turkish military and the, uh, the, uh, the US military had experience uh, to fight together and share their experiences. So then during the Korean War, Turkey joined NATO in 1952. So uh, in the 1950s, Turkey was a staunch supporter of the Western allies. So it was against, uh, for example, non-aligned movement or African and Asian uh, movements after the uh, decolonization uh, process. Uh, so Turkey, was very strange supporter of the Western Alliance. Uh, but of course, there are some changes uh, afterwards. Uh, basically, uh, because of the uh, appearance of the uh, Cyprus issue, uh, basically in the 1960s, uh, and Turkey's military intervention uh, finally came in 1974, uh, Turkey uh, felt its loneliness and also decided to keep a more balanced multilateral foreign policy and also decided to develop its relations with the uh, Warsaw Pact countries, uh, including the Soviet Union, and also non-aligned uh, countries uh, around the world, including India, uh, Yugoslavia, and some African countries, Egypt, of course, but basically also Arab countries to neighboring Arab countries too. So uh, there are ups and downs for pro-West and some balancing policies together uh, since early 1960s. Uh, and uh, these policies are changing. Of course, Turkey, uh, the, there is a debate whether Turkey is a Western country or not. Uh, we can say that yes, Turkey is a Western country with some exceptions because Turkey is a, a NATO member for a very long time. Uh, just after three years of the foundation of NATO, Turkey joined as a full member. And also Turkey has developed very uh, special uh, partnership uh, with the European Union. Uh, and also Turkey was declared as a candidate country in 1999. And also technically Turkey uh, is negotiating with, uh, with, with the European Union. Uh, so, uh, and economically Turkey is a part of the European Union. So Turkey joined uh, European Union's customs union uh, in 1996. So except a cultural sector, all Turkish economic sectors are uh, fully integrated to the European Union. Uh, the other also uh, Western institution, Turkey joined uh, OECD as an economic, Western economic institution. And also Turkey is a founding member of the Council of Europe uh, for uh, political solidarity and to improve uh, its uh, democratic standards. Uh, and also Turkey is a part of uh, jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the European uh, Court on uh, European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so these are the Turkey's uh, attachment to the Western world. But on the other side, uh, Turkish leaders, prime ministers, presidents, uh, different governments uh, have some ambition to develop more balanced relations with other countries. But uh, when we look at Turkey's uh, economic relations and political relations gravity, 
uh, uh, NATO countries and uh, the European Union uh, countries. Uh, sometimes European EU countries and NATO countries are overlapping uh, mostly, but uh, for security cooperation, defense cooperation, uh, and also economic uh, cooperation, the European Union is very important and NATO is very important pillar for Turkey's uh, security arch architecture and also defense industry. Uh, this is very uh, strong bond uh, for uh, Turkey uh, to uh, to uh, to the Western uh, side, uh, but on the other, uh, Turkey using the other card or advantage or sometimes try to uh, develop its economic relations uh, with other countries, uh, with countries in Africa and basically in East Asia. So uh, after the rise of the uh, Asian uh, economies, uh, starting with Japan, South Korea, uh, other Asian tigers, Southeast Asian nations, and uh, also recently China. They have become important for Turkey's economic relationship. Uh, China, for example, for last decade has become the third largest economic partner. Uh, of course, Russia is very important for Turkey uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, Ankara and Moscow developed uh, strong cooperations in terms of energy uh, and energy sector and also industry. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, had Turkey to build some heavy industries in Turkey in the uh, 1960s and 70s, uh, apart from the early period of the Republican time. Uh, and also Turkey developed pipelines uh, via uh, Russia, uh, and several pipelines uh, were built for last uh, three to four decades. And Russia today is to Turkey's uh, usually second trade partner after Germany. Uh, and China has become the third uh, largest trade partner for Turkey. Uh, mostly Turkey dependent on uh, Chinese imports for various uh, sectors and goods for that. Uh, so in, in that regard, Turkey, uh, yes, is very dependent on uh, Western countries economically, uh, politically, and also uh, in security means. But also uh, Turkey has developed uh, very strong uh, ties with neighboring countries, including Russia, uh, Arab countries, Iran, and also Turkey has very uh, developing uh, relationship with Asian countries, including uh, Japan, China, uh, South Korea and others. And India also has become increasing economic partner for Turkey. Uh, so these are the realities for that. Multidimensional policy is a must for, uh, for Turkey. And uh, with the help of the uh, increasing globalization, increasing globalist uh, ties uh, in the post-Cold War period, Turkey was, uh, was, uh, was one of the countries uh, mostly integrated to the global system. So Turkey is a, a strong uh, supporter of the globalization in that period. And also Turkey ha uh, has successfully integrated this global system in the post-Cold War period. And as an uh, advantage of this, uh, Turkey has become a, mem a member of the G20 uh, countries. So the top uh, 20 economies of the world, Turkey was invited uh, as a uh, board as, as, to the board of the global governance. So this is also uh, important assessment for Turkey, for Turkey's multidimensional policy for that. Uh, so uh, when we look at the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we can see that this is, there are two uh, main focus for Turkey. Uh, one is the uh, diversification uh, of Turkey's uh, foreign policy, uh, getting more multilateral framework as a G20 member. Uh, so in that regard, developing economic relations uh, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, members are very important. But on the other, uh, the Turkish governments and uh, particularly the, the current government, uh, the AKP uh, Justice and Development Party government, uh, also has also used this the, the SEO card as a bargaining chip to get uh, some leverage uh, with this uh, negotiation with other NATO countries and the uh, EU countries in that regard. So this is also bargaining chip for Turkey. So this is uh, main structure uh, for Turkey's foreign policy. So uh, because of its geo geopolitical advantage, uh, Turkish leaders or politicians 
have a tendency to use all assets uh, from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, uh, from other aspects to get some leverage for their uh, foreign policies to support their political rule in Turkey uh, for getting uh, getting some foreign support for this uh, domestic political uh, policies. Uh, so there are, there are different anchors for that. Uh, so we can say that Turkey has, uh, of course, multilateral uh, perspective of, of foreign policy. Uh, and also there are some government, Turkish government priorities rather than Turkey's long-term national interests sometimes. So short-term uh, interests are also important rather than long-term uh, perspectives for that. But uh, this is always a part of Turkey's uh, main political uh, motivation, uh, both for foreign policy and domestic policy. I want to stop here. So then if you have uh, questions, we can go in detail. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for giving us a very comprehensive overview there. What exactly Turkey's multilateral foreign policy has been, how it has evolved, and you gave us a lovely trajectory there, but also looked at the two main institutions that we are focusing on, NATO and SEO, and how there's a certain degree of um, proaction on the part of uh, very proactive foreign policy on the part of Turkey in order to work with two very large and very timely measures that were taken, whether it was joining NATO uh, way back in the 1950s or whether it was joining the SEO a decade ago. Uh, there has been strategy, there's been a rationale for that action that mm -hmm. was taken. Professor, if we look at the SCO now in 2022, and there is a lot of talk about Turkey wanting to become a full member. Turkey mm -hmm. has been a dialogue partner since 2012, uh, has been participating. This year, we also mm -hmm. saw at the sessions, we saw the Turkish president being present. Normally, it's a gathering only of the full members or those who have complete membership who mm -hmm. are there at the level of head of state. But this time, we also had the presence of the Turkish leader. Now, isn't this also a clear signal that Turkey is trying to up the momentum of its membership in the SCO, and it would also then become the first NATO member to become a member of the SCO? Now, mm -hmm. does this put Turkey into some kind of compromising situation? Yes, it is, as you mentioned, a bargaining chip when working with NATO or working with other countries there. But is it also a situation of a uh, bit of uncomfortable situation there, or is this something that is being used entirely to the advantage of the Turkish people who are going to benefit from membership in two very mm. influential institutions, one which has grown, one which is grown? Yeah, this is a good point. So th th there is an increasing debate for that. Uh, but uh, basically, when we look at realities, uh, um, despite some uh, revelations of the, some uh, intentions for Turkey's full membership to the SEO, uh, so uh, the, the assessment, if Turkey joins uh, the, F, the SCO, the uh, expected outcomes are not that much for Turkey. There are for, uh, some certain reasons for that. One main reason is the, the, the structure of the SCO. The SCO is now, uh, yes, it, 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 it is formed as a Shanghai Five uh, first, uh, as a, a border cooperation uh, led by China and then uh, under the leadership of uh, China and uh, Russia together and three uh, Central Asian countries bordering with China, uh, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan and uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so they, they got some assessment and then they turned uh, into the SEO uh, with the participation of uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, but uh, the, the initial expectation of China uh, to develop the SEO more integrated regional organization in Eurasia. Uh, but uh, Russia uh, was not very willing to uh, deep, uh, further integration within the SEO because of uh, some fear of the losing advantage for Central Asia. If uh, there is an increasing uh, Chinese influence in Central Asia, the former Soviet uh, republics, so this will be a disadvantageous position uh, for Russian influence there. So with this intention, uh, Moscow uh, basically was against uh, deepening of the organization like uh, within the format of the European Union or, or NATO uh, as a defense organization. Uh, all the time, uh, the SCO has stayed as a uh, intergovernmental organizations 
with uh, some weak uh, cooperation areas, not very strong and integrated cooperation areas in that regard. Uh, and also uh, the, I can say the expansion of the uh, SEO with India and Pakistan uh, means uh, the organization has become a loose regional cooperation uh, to discuss security, uh, economic cooperation, border security, uh, and also uh, combat against the uh, illicit networks, terrorism, and other things. But anyhow, uh, the SEO has become an organization for a discussion platform for some certain issues. Uh, and also there are differences. If you accept India and Pakistan together, that means all these bilateral problems will be uh, on an agenda uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the SEO. In that regard, uh, the SEO is not uh, very uh, deep-rooted, strong, uh, and integrated organization. Uh, these facts are not well known by Turkish politicians. So they just focus on uh, basic comparison and simp very simplistic comparison, the SEO and, uh, and NATO or the European Union or NATO. Uh, for example, when we, look at, when we analyze the uh, Prime Minister and then uh, President uh, Erdogan's statements about SEO uh, for, for the last decade, for the last 10 years, uh, so sometimes Erdogan used uh, the SEO as an alternative for the European Union, sometimes as an alternative of the uh, NATO, sometimes as an alternative of both. But when we compare uh, separately the SEO and the European Union as an economic integration level, or uh, the SEO and NATO as defense cooperation and organization, so SEO is, is, is in the beginning. So then uh, there is not that much strong leverage uh, to deliver to, to its members. It is basically, there are many international organizations like that. So it is economically, for example, SEO is much more weaker than the ASEAN in Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, here, uh, basically, uh, we can analyze that Turkish uh, politicians used a SEO card for a bare bargaining. So if they are uh, in negotiation for something, with NATO countries or the European Union countries. So uh, look, if you don't give this, or if you don't tolerate for our this policy, we can go some other uh, uh, place. We have some alternatives, we have some other cards. Uh, so in that regard, uh, this is uh, one, one main goal uh, for the, Tur the Turkish, uh, current Turkish government. But if you analyze, the intention of the Turkish government, the same government and same leader for uh, 20 years, but for last uh, 10 years, basically since 2012, uh, the uh, intentions are not clear. Uh, also, there is no cert there is no very strong timetable or roadmap for the membership of the SEO. And also, usually Turkey has a tendency: if there is an international organization, Turkey wants to join. Even if in Latin America, so Turkish governments are willing to join. In Africa, Turkey is willing to join. For example, Turkey now is a, uh, has an observer, so, so the African Union, the Arab League, and others, and also Turkey signed, has become a, a sectoral dialogue partner of the ASEAN uh, in, 19, uh, in 2017. Uh, and also uh, Turkey wants to join BRICS, for example, uh, the group of uh, emerging uh, leading economies, uh, Brazil, uh, uh, Russia, India, and uh, South Africa, China, and South Africa. Uh, so uh, th there's a willingness for that. But when we compare their capabilities, uh, for example, for the SCO and NATO as defense organizations, NATO, of course, is much more sophisticated, uh, much more developed, and also the only uh, joint security organization in the world. So there is no similar thing for that. And also the Russia-Ukraine war uh, simply uh, uh, showed that uh, Western and NATO uh, defense capabilities for tactical uh, means and also for military technology, defense technology. They are much more superior than uh, the former Soviet technologies and current Russian technologies. So on, on the battleground, when we compare the tactical and uh, weapon systems and technology, defense technologies, uh, there is a huge disparity for NATO side provided to, uh, to the Ukraine. Uh, so usually Ukraine has a, a relatively very young 
uh, military, young army, but despite that, they resisted a lot with the help of NATO support uh, for training, tactical support, and also uh, weapons support for that. It has become clear that in that regard, uh, SEO technologies, for example, leading countries like uh, Russia, uh, China, India, their defense technologies are uh, not very competitive with NATO technologies in that regard. And for, for, for military cooperation also, the NATO capability uh, is, is the very unique one. So there is no other organizations, including the uh, SEO has a, that capa capacity for that. Uh, if we consider the SEO as an economic organization, we cannot compare with the, uh, with the European Union. So, so the European Union is the most developed uh, economic integration and most successful economic integration in the world, regional integration in the world. And Turkey economy is part of it. Even if uh, even Turkey is not full member, but economically is a part of this uh, for that. Uh, and uh, the other issue, maybe we need to uh, focus on that. Uh, for example, Turkey has very uh, positive and cooperative uh, political and economic relations with almost all SEO members, including Central Asian countries today uh, with Russia, China, Pakistan, and despite some issues because of the uh, Pakistan issues factors, uh, also having very uh, strong uh, trade uh, relationship with India uh, too. So Turkey uh, can get uh, whatever it wants at the bilateral level, so without uh, membership of the SCO. So in that regard, the SCO membership, if uh, Turkey joins the SCO, uh, there are not very huge outcomes for that. And as a dialogue partner, like Sri Lanka and some other countries, Turkey can also join the uh, SCO platforms. For example, uh, also uh, President Erdogan was invited by uh, President Putin uh, to the uh, SCO Samarkand uh, summit. Recently, uh, so uh, then uh, the SEO platforms are open, and also Turkey joined the uh, Energy Club of the SEO. In uh, it was formed in uh, 2017 as a gesture to Turkey. Without being a full member, as a dialogue partner, Turkey can join the SEO uh, organizations, activities, and some other things. So there's a flexibility here also. That's a good point you're bringing up there, Professor. When you're talking about SCO and uh, when you do a comparison with NATO, we're looking at a very old organization and a comparatively young organization. But you, and of course, we know SCO started with the whole process of demilitarized borders, uh, talking about the three evils of separatism, extremism, and terrorism. But it has also now evolved. And you also mentioned just now about the energy sector. Now, out of all the dialogue partners, Sri Lanka included, and Sri Lanka was the first dialogue partner back in 2009. If you look at all the dialogue partners and the amount of integration, cooperation, action that is being taken with the SCO, Turkey is at the forefront. Turkey is leading in the energy sector. Hasn't this been hugely beneficial to Turkey in order through its multilateral approach with the countries in Central Asia, with Russia, with China, with other countries? Or do you think that from a bilateral perspective, Turkey was any way benefiting with those countries? How would you how would you weigh those two? Was it the multilateral platform that really created fresh impetus for energy? Or was that already taking place on a bilateral level? Uh, yeah, for energy cooperation is very important. I will look at uh, uh, fossil energies, fossil energy sources, uh, natural gas and oil. Turkey is a uh, is a uh, importer uh, and also as a hub transit hub for this energy from uh, from east to west from uh, Eurasia or Asia to uh, to, to, to Europe. Uh, there are many pipeline lines from Azerbaijan, from Russia, uh, from Iran, uh, from Iraq. Uh, there are various uh, oil and gas pipelines for that. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, this is Turkey is on in the middle of this. But these uh, initiatives are beyond uh, the SEO initiatives. Now uh, Iran has become a full member. Uh, previously, it was observer member. Uh, but uh, uh, these initiatives are developed bilateral level or some uh, multilateral level, including some European countries. But here is the difficulty uh, after the. Uh, start of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, now there are sanctions to uh, Russian gas and oil. 
So uh, recently, uh, President uh, Putin uh, declared a project building a Russian gas hub uh, in, in Turkey. But uh, if the European countries do not demand any Russian gas, so then uh, this, this hub uh, cannot be functioned. You know, then it, 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 will, it will become useless. Uh, and of course, Turkey can uh, get its demands directly from Russia and also Azerbaijan and uh, Iran too, but also still the US sanctions uh, have continued uh, again on, uh, on Iran uh, for, for oil and gas. Uh, so the usually European countries are not very eager to buy uh, Iranian oil and gas without a, without a deal, a nuclear deal again. So there are difficulties here. But uh, the, maybe the SEO cooperation basically will be an uh, advantage for Turkey uh, for alternative energy sources or uh, green development uh, perspectives of that. But in that regard, uh, China is very important. Uh, so, uh, but on the other, uh, Turkey can directly cooperate with China uh, without SEO platform for that. Uh, so, of course, China. Uh, has declared Belt Road Initiative, uh, Overland Silk Road, uh, Maritime Silk Road, and others. Uh, but it is uh, difficult to identify uh, which one is the Belt Road Initiative projects, uh, which ones are uh, Chinese bilateral projects. Usually all Chinese in initiatives are uh, branded under the name of the Belt Road Initiative in that regard. But uh, for this, uh, let, me take, let me, uh, look at or functioning of the SUA in, in general, uh, still bilateralism is very dominant. So if there is no uh, multilateral agreement on that, so uh, the, 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 we can we cannot see uh, joint SEO uh, policy or strategies in that regard. And, and the other challenge uh, for the SEO with the participation of uh, India, so uh, India, and China, on the one side, are economic partners, but on the other, they, they have some uh, competing interests, uh, strategic interests, and also some economic interests for that. Uh, so reaching a consensus for, for, for some certain sectors are not that much easy. But of course, they are working within the BRICS uh, umbrella, so then they, they coordinate the BRICS. Uh, maybe if there's a further co coordination in BRICS, there will be a positive reflection uh, to, to the SEO cooperation for that. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, when we look at the map members, uh, the size of uh, geography, the size of population, uh, and other things, the SEO is a very giant organization. But when we look at their functions as an uh, influential and effective uh, international organization, we cannot say that uh, the SEO is very well functioning and a very efficient uh, organization. Sure. Uh, Professor, if I were to just turn to the side of looking at NATO, now we know that countries like Finland and Sweden have been trying to join. Uh, they are aspiring to become full members of NATO. Uh, but of course, Turkey is not uh, supportive of that. Could you shed some light on that? Why they are opposing it? Why, why Turkey is not keen on these two countries becoming members of NATO? Uh, Turkey's objects in basically Turkish government objects uh, come comes from uh, basically come from some uh, some uh, prior to policy crisis rather than uh, substantial objection for that. Uh, technically, Turkey is not against uh, for the membership of uh, Sweden and uh, Sweden and Finland to to NATO, but the Turkish government has uh, considered. Uh, this as a window of opportunity to get more uh, things uh, from uh, Sweden and Finland because basically Sweden uh, was critical for Turkey's Syria policy and Turkey's military involvement there. Uh, and also providing some uh, non-military help to the uh, Kurdish authorities in Northeast Syria. Uh, and uh, there were some other disagreements between uh, Turkey, but basically not only between Turkey and Finland, but uh, the Turkish government has used uh, this opportunity to object or to get something basically from other big NATO countries, particularly from the United States. Uh, for example, F-16 deals and others. Uh, so uh, using this uh, approval card, 
uh, for the membership of uh, Sweden and Finland to get more uh, things from the United States and other uh, NATO countries. For example, uh, Britain also lifts some restrictions uh, of arms sales and the technology transfers to uh, Turkish defense industry with the help of this process. So these are the tactical uh, things for the Turkish government, not a substantial thing. So if uh, the Turkish government gets some level of satisfaction, then there will be uh, approval of uh, these uh, memberships. Turkey said yes, and now uh, there was an integration process for that. And, uh, and now there, there is a need for approval of Turkish parliament uh, for the membership of uh, and Sweden and Finland as a final stage. Now Turkey is the only country not approving uh, from its parliament. So still maybe uh, the, the, the Turkish uh, leaders or Turkish leadership considers is the opportunity to get more. Uh, thing at the tactical levels rather than uh, strategic levels. But at the end of the day, uh, Turkey will ratify uh, without uh, huge delay uh, for this issue because uh, after time being, uh, recently Hungary uh, as the, uh, the, the last two, one of the last two countries not ratifying uh, the memberships from uh, their parliaments, Hungary ratified the membership of Sweden and Finland. Now Turkey is the only country uh, in coming weeks, there will be more pressure on Turkey to approve this process, ratify this process through its parliament. Uh, but at the end of the day, they will be a member. They will join, join the uh, NATO, and there, there will be uh, expansion of NATO. Uh, and basically, all EU countries uh, will uh, become a NATO members at the end of the day, maybe excluding Austria or some few exceptions. Professor, just one final question to ask you before we bring this particular dialogue lecture forum to a close. We've looked at SCO, looked at NATO. With regard to the SCO, Turkey is having a very promising position. They're playing a very proactive role. They're going all out there and getting quite involved in the SCO, even though not a full member. With NATO, Turkey is a very important member, having been around from the very beginning almost having continued to play a very critical role there. As we go forward from an academic point of view, we are now on the eve of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Republic of Turkey. What do you think should be the multilateral strategy for foreign policy of Turkey? Should it be focusing more on NATO, given the fact that Turkey sits next to Europe, uh, we could argue is technically a part of Europe, or is it should be, be with the SCO in terms of Asia, looking at the Asian century, looking at what is going to happen in the years ahead? Or do you think it should be something that is being adopted at the moment where attempts are being made to balance the two, but maybe we're not getting a lot that couldn't be gotten from the two? What is your stance from an academic point of view? How do you see that going forward? I think uh, there are some barriers for the full membership of SCO. Uh, so far, uh, other NATO countries uh, were silent, but recently Germany uh, has objected, officially objected Turkey's uh, full membership to the SCO because NATO countries ha have some certain uh, restrictions and concerns uh, for military cooperation, basically for military cooperation and defense cooperation with Russia and China. Uh, so, uh, and Turkey, for example, was uh, out, was dismissed by the United States from the uh, F-35 uh, fighter jets, fifth generation uh, fighter jets projects. Turkey was a co-producer and owner of the project, one of the owners of the project, and Turkey was dismissed uh, during the, uh, after uh, purchasing of the uh, F-16, uh, F S-400 uh, missiles. Uh, the missile systems uh, from Russia in 19, in 2019. Uh, so these are showing the uh, limitations uh, of the cooperation, defense cooperation with the SCO. And Turkish defense industry is heavily dependent on Western and NATO systems in, the, in that regard. So Turkey, uh, Turkey's air defense priority has, uh, has, now, has become under challenge because Turkey now is out of the F-35 uh, projects uh, and uh, Turkish F-16 fighter jets uh, 
uh, are getting older uh, and try to buy new uh, F-16 fighter jets. These are the old generation uh, of the fighter jets. But as an alternative, Turkey uh, tries to buy British, uh, French, and other NATO uh, jets. So then if you buy from them, uh, other NATO country, uh, there is no problem. But if you buy very sophisticated weapons uh, or fighter jets, or missile technologies from Russia, China, this will be a problem uh, for Turkey and transforming Turkey's military and defense industry and capability from uh, NATO Western system to uh, Russia, uh, Russian Chinese system is not that much easy and very expensive one. And we, we, we need to talk hundred uh, billion dollars uh, for that. Uh, so I think there is a red line there. So then Turkey's uh, full membership to the SEO is not that much easy. So there will be strong warning uh, from the NATO side if it has become uh, more uh, reality or it has become more concrete uh, uh, idea or path. Uh, so the, the, this is the, uh, these are the limitations, not only this, but also cooperation with some other uh, countries within the SEO is the uh, limitations for that. Uh, but on the other, uh, economic cooperation uh, and some other uh, sectoral cooperations with the SEO countries are not problem. So uh, for, mm, there are some strategic sectors, but the outside of the strategic sectors, Turkey can cooperate for that. But there are limitations because uh, after the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, so there are increasing tensions uh, uh, between NATO and, and, and Russia, and also in the Asia Pacific side, there are increasing uh, com strategic competitions and uh, strategic divergences between, uh, between the United States and China. So these are the limitations for that. So then this is a critical uh, balance. So if there is a further escalation and confrontation between uh, the Western side, Russia and China, so then Turkey is joining to the uh, SEO will be under question uh, for that without leaving Western institutions, for example, without leaving uh, NATO and without leaving the EU uh, membership path. But uh, when we look at realities on the ground, uh, Turkey is very deeply integrated uh, to the European economy, to the uh, defense uh, and uh, military technologies and capabilities to NATO. So uh, under these conditions, Turkey's uh, direction, Turkey's uh, decision uh, move from west to east is not, is not that much easy. And uh, the current uh, Turkish government cannot decide uh, that much easily. But of course, there are some minor tactical steps, but these tactical steps at the end of the day depends on the, some certain strategy. And Turkey is also the, another restriction for Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a middle power country. Uh, and uh, Turkey has some limitations, uh, despite all uh, diplomatic activism and other things. Uh, and uh, the NATO, NATO and the European Union are very decisive uh, long-term projects or organizations, and also fixing its member countries or candidate countries' policies. In that sense, Turkey's economy policy and defense strategies are fixed by either NATO or uh, the European Union. And these are very decisive institutions. Uh, in the short term, Turkey fixed some policies, but in the long term, Turkey acts uh, on the direction of the, uh, these Western institutions. For example, economically, Turkey, when we analyze Turkey's economic move uh, since the end of the Second World War to the present time, Turkey's economic policy policies are driven by the European Union, the IMF, the World Bank for these or the OECD uh, driven by these institutions. And Turkey's defense uh, and military policies are uh, strategies are fixed by the NATO. So the, these are the clear. So uh, the, within the current conditions, the, the, uh, the current uh, institutions, Turkish institutions and the current Turkish government uh, have not uh, enough uh, capacities and capabilities to draw on its way so that there are somewhat dependencies for that. So Turkey's attachment to the West is very strong. But of course, Turkey uh, in the short run, try to use some tactical steps to get more 
in, in that regard, but with uh, some limitations. Professor, thank you so very much. You've given us an excellent uh, analysis of the situation, the scenario, how multilateralism has been used by Turkey, with whether it be the emphasis mainly on NATO and FTO, but you also brought in the European Union, how Turkey is working with the EU as well. Uh, we are extremely appreciative of you giving us of your time uh, in order to uh, record this session of the Avalo Lecture Forum to help us understand Turkish foreign policy that much better, to understand where Turkey is going with NATO, where Turkey is going with the SCO, what the potential is, what the challenges are, how they can try to overcome them. So thank you once again for taking time to join. Uh, welcome. Also, thank you for uh, having me. Again. Have a good day. Thank you. We indeed honored to have had and listened to Professor Dr. Salchuk Cholak Olu, the founding director of the Turkish Center for Asia Pacific Studies in Turkey, also a member of the Beijing Normal University, Hong Kong Baptist University, United International College based in China. Professor Salchuk took us through looking at Turkey, looking at NATO, looking at the SCO, especially on this landmark anniversary as Turkey is on the eve of its centenary. 99 years since the creation of the Republic of Turkey. And it helped us understand that much better how foreign policy is being formulated. What are the key indicators that we have to look out for? What is happening within the country? How are these having an impact on relations and foreign policy in general? And with that, we end this session of the Avada Lecture Forum. Join us again next time. We focus on another aspect. Might be an important date, might be an anniversary, it might be an event or a personality in the world of international relations as we try to increase awareness and generate dialogue here with the Avalo Commission.